This video is sponsored by Incogni. US suburbs are symbols of the American dream. In the post-war boom period, owning that house with the two cars was considered the apex of prosperity and modern living. Clean streets, manicured lawns, brand new highway infrastructure, the family living comfortably on dad's salary, mom staying home to take care of the 2.5 children. Following the horrors of World War II, such living standards were almost utopian for the average person. And yet, America had made it possible. Welcome to the new golden age of post-war civilization. But something was wrong. As the suburbs flourished, other parts of US towns and cities were rotting away, creating huge swaths of dead tissue in the heart of the country. When you drove out of those beautiful suburbs, you often found yourself in areas best described as post-apocalyptic. Centers of culture and commerce were left condemned and abandoned. Vibrant communities disappeared. Formerly bustling main streets were deserted. Meanwhile, the suburbs continued to grow unabated, and in many areas continue to do so to this day. Since then, however, the post-war economic boom was supplanted by painful stagnation and mountains of debt. Owning a house, let alone living off a single salary, is but a ludicrous fantasy for the young generation. Depression and loneliness run rampant within society, affecting men especially. Commutes are getting longer, traffic jams are getting worse, the infrastructure is slowly falling apart. The American dream is dead. And it was the suburbs that delivered the killing blow. How is that possible? What on earth happened here? Let's find out. I've identified three key points which I'm going to cover. And I would also like to thank Incogni for sponsoring today's video. Incogni helps protect your privacy by reaching out to holders of your personal data on your behalf and requesting their removal. This personal data ranges from your full legal name, phone number, date of birth, home address, or even shopping habits. The process of removal is fully automated. Once launched, it does not require any further action from you. Incogni will be dealing with holders of your personal data on your behalf. Imagine giving out your contact information somewhere and it gets sold off, and you start receiving unwanted marketing or even scam calls. Or if some website with your personal data on it gets breached and then someone takes out a loan under your name and identity. Not a fun time. This is where Incogni comes in, or hopefully before all of this, by handling personal data removal for you on your behalf. First, create an account and tell them whose data they'll be requesting to remove. Second, grant Incogni permission to act on your behalf. They'll be contacting holders of your personal information to get it wiped from their databases. Third, kick back and relax and watch Incogni handle all that for you. You'll be able to keep track of that progress live. Don't let your personal data fall into the wrong hands. The first 100 people to use my code at the link below will get 60% off Incogni. Thank you for checking out Incogni. Ads like this help support what I do. And now, back to the video. When we compare a European suburb to their American counterparts, what differences are there? The European suburb is usually denser, has mixed zoning, mid-rises, there are local workplaces, a public transit connection, and busy highways are led outside the residential areas. In the US, suburbs are much more spread out. There is no mixed zoning or mid-rises, meaning there are only single-family homes, workplaces are far away, usually there is no public transit, and highways are put right through the neighborhood. And so, US suburbs and them being spread out. We call this urban sprawl. Which leads to our first point. Right outside of town there is a hill with a large tree on top, overlooking a creek bend. A place where children would adventure, where young couples would have their first kiss. Well, now it's all built up with same-looking suburbs. That small forest locals used to hike and relax in, all bulldozed for a suburb. That racetrack people would hang out on a Saturday evening, closed, demolished and replaced by a suburb. Billy Bob's ranch where he would teach kids to ride horses in his free time, gone, destroyed for a suburb. That cornfield kids used to play in during summer break, eaten by a suburb. The church that served as a community center for a century, it had to go to make way for the new highway. Uncle Mike's general store, where he would sell his wife's cannolis on Sunday, went bankrupt and closed as soon as the Walmart Supercenter opened. Everything that made the American town what it was, is gone. Destroyed to make way for an endless sea of same looking houses. Was it worth it? For developers, it sure as hell was, they made out like bandits. As for you, the taxpayer, I have bad news. You've inherited a Ponzi scheme, a ticking financial time bomb. Those beautiful new suburbs, since they are so spread out, they need lots of infrastructure. Makes sense, right? Everything is farther apart, so you need more of everything. Water mains, sewage pipes, underground cables, and a lot of road surface. A lot of road surface. The good news is, the federal government and the Department of Transportation paid for most of those. The city barely needed to put in any money. The bad news is, all this infrastructure has a planned lifespan – 15, 20, 25 years – after which you need to overhaul them. This means tearing up the road, digging up everything, replacing the piping and the wires, and having to re-asphalt potentially hundreds of kilometers of roads. This is of course extremely expensive. So who's paying for it? The suburbs, right? From their property taxes. And no, 
By being so spread out, thus housing fewer people, they do not generate enough money to pay for their own infrastructure. The suburbs are essentially welfare queens. Therefore, planned overhauls have to be paid with more new development. US cities have to grow constantly to get additional tax revenue to finance the existing infrastructure. And if a city stops growing, everything falls apart almost instantly. When such a city is threatened with bankruptcy due to its suburbs, the federal government steps in to bail them out and finance the overhauls with your taxpayers' money. So not only are US suburbs gobbling up the historic landscape, they fleece taxpayers for billions of dollars each year. But hey, the real estate developers got rich, and the suburban inhabitants are very happy with their quality of life, and that there are no minorities in their neighborhood. The post-World War II suburban boom was in large part due to low interest loans for veterans offered by the government. White veterans, that is. In addition, there was this thing called redlining, where the government delineated urban areas where minorities lived, usually African Americans, and declared the area hazardous and unsuitable for investment. This meant that inhabitants of the area would not be able to get mortgages or loans because banks wouldn't issue them any, because the areas they lived in were unsuitable for investment, quote unquote. This government meddling crippled business activity, thus cementing millions of people in poverty. It also kept black people out of the suburbs since they couldn't afford to move there, which was of course the whole point. But here's the funny part. By nature of being densely populated urban areas, many inner city black majority neighborhoods still produced quite a lot of tax revenue. More than the surrounding white suburbs actually, which were, as we discussed, financially unviable. So cities took the revenue from redlined, impoverished ethnic majority areas and spent it on subsidizing white suburbia. Talk about injustice. Meanwhile, in the clean, beautiful, subsidized suburbs, a silent epidemic was spreading. Turns out, living in a box in a sea of other same-looking boxes in the middle of a street labyrinth is bad for your mental health, especially if you had to stay there all day long like those stay-at-home wives. This was the true traditional conservative lifestyle, where women were socially pressured to not pursue any careers, to stay home barefoot and pregnant, to be soft, quiet, amicable, and to not wear pants. Uh, yes, if you wore pants as a woman, many people would judge or ostracize you all the way till the 70s, depending on how conservative the area was. Being forced into roles, ways of behavior, and even clothing naturally did not do a lot of good for suburban women. Substance abuse was consequently widespread. You're stuck in a box all day long doing housework and tending to kids, then there is your husband, who does not necessarily treat you like his equal, <laughs> traditional conservatism and all. You have no meaningful career pads, you always have to act a certain way, only wear cute dresses, and put up with your husband's bullshit constantly. If you think I'm exaggerating, check out these adverts from the era. Keep her where she belongs. Show her it's a man's world. Buy our coffee or your husband will beat you. And my favorite, it's nice to have a girl around the house. It doesn't get any more overt than that, I think. In the traditional conservative suburban utopia, women were treated as second-class citizens, basically. As a result, when you see those smiling housewives on 1950s illustrations, well, they were most likely on something. Alcohol, pills, whatever substance they could get their hands on to bear the boredom and being treated as sentient property. But hey, at least sometimes you could get away from it all by taking the kids somewhere. Not on foot, not on bike. Not on a bus, tram or train either, as those were long discontinued. Your only option was none other than... By virtue of being so spread out, suburbs are car-centric. There is no other way of getting around. Distances are too large on foot, and biking is too dangerous due to heavy traffic. Public transportation cannot be built either. Since houses are far apart, much fewer people will live within practical distance of any transit stop. If you put a tram stop in a European suburb, you got hundreds of people living near it. In the American suburbs, it's a few dozen, meaning our transit line could not have a ridership justifying its existence. And it was around this time that Americans discovered the phenomenon called induced demand. Meaning, the more roads and parking capacity you build, the more people will choose to drive and the worse will traffic get. Basically, people will choose cars until it's no longer viable, meaning only when the road gets completely clogged do they start looking for alternatives like public transit or biking. In the suburbs, there are no alternatives. Cars are your only option. And you need them constantly. A big part of this is the lack of mixed zoning. You can't have, say, a corner store in your street because only residential buildings are allowed. Commercial buildings are usually heavily concentrated in one area, which will be far away for most people. You can't just walk down to Mike's General Store for some beer. You have to get in your car and drive 15 minutes to the Walmart Supercenter. To accommodate all the people forced to drive, massive car infrastructure had to be built. In the US, highways and roads were put right through the suburbs. And not only there. 
See, while more and more people lived in the suburbs, their jobs were still in the city. And now you had hundreds of thousands of people wanting to commute there by car. The logical answer was to build out proper public transportation with some large suburban parking garages so people can leave their cars there and go to the city via public transit. This was the logical solution. So naturally, Americans started demolishing their cities to make way for giant urban freeways. Particularly areas with minorities in them, if you can believe that. If you look at before and after photos of American cities, the difference really is shocking. Some of these aren't even cities anymore, just a few loose buildings among the highways and parking lots. When I saw this photo, at first I thought it was some bombed out city after a war. But no, this is just what cars and suburbanization did to downtown Houston. Suburbanization has done irreparable damage to the US, gobbling up the landscape, locking taxpayers into Ponzi schemes, being tools for discrimination and gilded cages for women, forcing enormous highways to be built, city centers to be demolished, all in the name of corporate business interest. As the American landscape disappeared, as downtowns were torn down, as American culture's roots were systematically broiled and upturned, Real estate developers, car manufacturers, and big retail chains made billions upon billions in profits. From taxpayers' money, essentially. You know memes like you'll own nothing and be happy and get in the pot, eat the bug? Those aren't some distant future dystopia. That's life in the suburbs. The bank owns your house via mortgage, your car via loan, and you live in a cardboard holding pen in a sea of other holding pens, which would be your pod. As for eating the bug, 24 million Americans live in so-called food deserts, areas with little to no access to fresh food. And the biggest factor there is transportation. In Europe, you can just hop onto affordable public transit to get to a store selling fresh food. In the US, if you can't afford the annual cost of car ownership, that's $10,728 on average, you might lose access to fresh food. You'll have to eat the bug. At the end of the day, Americans must decide what the US should be. A soulless corporate machine that eats human lives and churns out money, or an actual country with community, culture, and cohesive society by the people for the people. Should you as an American want the second option, there are a number of tried and tested things you can do. Bother your local decision makers to institute mixed zoning. Support local measures to densify the suburbs so they'll be able to pay for themselves. Support highway removals and oppose road widening. Advocate for public transit and separated bike paths at your local town hall meeting. Look, if any such measures will be on the ballot sometime, then go and vote for them. In your local elections, read up on what each candidate wants to do about the issues mentioned here. Pick the one with the best plans and put the X next to their name. Oh, and you can also join the Strong Towns movement at strongtowns.org, an organization working to fix US suburbia. And if you want to learn more about the topic of urbanism and transportation, in the description I put a list of books you can check out for further reading. Thank you for watching and thanks to Incogni for sponsoring today's video. As I've mentioned, you can use the link in the description and get 60% off. And I'll be seeing you next time.